As we make clear in the title of this meeting, the Labor government's appointment of an administrator to run the construction division of the CFMEU is not just an attack on building workers. This is a frontal assault on the entire working class. Australia already had one of the most anti-democratic industrial relations regimes in the world. That is, above all, as a result of measures imposed by Labor governments with the support of the union bureaucracy itself. Most strikes are illegal, except when enterprise bargaining is underway every few years, and there are a host of laws on the books to victimise militant and oppositional workers. But the imposition of an administrator over the CFMEU goes even further. Almost overnight, 80,000 construction workers have been completely disenfranchised. Their previous minimal rights have been overturned. A lawyer handpicked by the Labor government, Mark Irving KC, is now the effective dictator of the construction division. Any industrial action CFMEU members want to take to fight for their jobs, wages and conditions is now subject to the approval of a senior barrister who answers only to the state. He is empowered to dismiss union officials, employees and workplace delegates, expel union members, determine when and under what circumstances elections can be held, and oversee the union's day-to-day -day operations. Anyone removed from a union position through this process will be prohibited from running for office or being employed in any union or serving as a bargaining representative at all for up to five years, and only then with the express permission of the Fair Work Commission. Now, as written, these laws only apply to the construction division of the CFMEU, but there's nothing to stop them being extended to cover any section of workers. We should remember that not a single word of this legislation existed before August 12. The message from the Labor government and its then Workplace Relations Minister Tony, Tony Burke was very clear. If the ruling elite demands even sharper attacks on workers, the already extremely repressive laws will simply be changed to facilitate them. Labor's attack is not about fighting corruption or ridding the union of bikies, thugs and underworld gangs. That's just a pretext. It is about slashing the wages and conditions of building workers. The Labor government and the financial and corporate elite it represents intend for this anti-democratic administration to serve as a blueprint to be used against any and all sections of workers. For this reason, the administration of the CFMEU cannot be allowed to succeed. It must be fought, not just by building workers, but by the working class as a whole. This fight can be won, but only if workers understand what they are really up against. The attack on construction workers is not an isolated or standalone issue. The administration of the CFMEU is a concentrated expression of what the ruling elite has in store for the entire working class. Why is it that Labor has taken this even greater step in attacking the rights of workers on behalf of the capitalist state? That can only be answered by looking at the context within which the administration has been imposed. Global capitalism is in an unprecedented crisis. The only response of the capitalist class is war abroad and a war against the working class at home. This country is no exception. The Australian ruling elite is all in on the two existing fronts of imperialist war, the US-NATO war against Russia and Ukraine, and Israel's genocidal war in the Middle East. Billions of dollars are being funneled into military preparations for Australia to play a frontline role in a US-led war against China, in what Labor's Defence Industry Minister Pat Conroy described this week as the greatest arms race in our region since 1945. This requires a massive attack on the working class. This includes the increasing use of police state measures of repression, 
starkly displayed in recent weeks with the crackdown on anti-war protests, including student arrests on campus. At the same time, the cost of this warmongering must be imposed upon workers through the slashing of wages and social spending. The construction union has been targeted because doubts have emerged in the ruling class over its capacity to adequately suppress the demands of a historically militant section of the workforce. While still far short of the rising cost of living, the 5 to 6% average annual pay rises in recent CFMEU deals are considered unacceptably high amid a slowdown in the construction sector and a broader economic slump. Because this is such a significant turning point for the working class, and because there are so many lies and falsifications surrounding the administration, it's worth reviewing in some detail how this attack was prepared. What emerges is a political conspiracy. It is clear that the Labor government, police agencies, construction companies and the union bureaucracy all colluded to enforce this attack on construction workers. On July 10 and 11, the Australian Financial Review published two exclusives. One was about a report commissioned by the Master Builders Association of Queensland claiming that strict adherence to the CFMEU's EBA could add 33% to the cost of builds. The other reported the claim of another separate report commissioned by the Master Builders in New South Wales that the 7% nominal first year pay rise in the New South Wales EBA would increase labour costs by 19%. On July 12th, John Setka announced his immediate resignation as Victorian branch secretary, citing an ongoing and relentless media campaign against him. On July 13th, Nine entertainment newspapers published the first articles in the Building Bad series. The same day, Labor Prime Minister Al Anthony Albanese said it was good that Setka had stepped down and that unions don't exist to engage in the sort of conduct that John Setka has clearly been engaged with. In other words, with the ink barely dry on the first articles, the Labor Prime Minister was endorsing the unproven allegations as facts. It's worth recalling what was actually alleged in these initial articles. That four CFMEU construction delegates in Victoria were former or current members of outlaw motorcycle clubs with ties to criminality. That Setka personally knew so-called underworld figure Nick Gatto, who has established himself as an industrial mediator in the building industry. Many people, including in construction companies and political parties, likewise have had dealings with Gatto, which is not a crime, that Darren Greenfield, head of the construction division in New South Wales, received a $5,000 kickback from a construction boss in 2020, that the construction division provided workplace enterprise agreements to select companies with which it had cosy relations based on the claims of self-described CFMEU fixer Harry Corris. These claims are not only unsubstantiated, they're also exceptionally thin. On July 17th, then Workplace Relations Minister Tony Burke said the government would support the imposition of an administrator on the CFMEU's construction division by the federal court on the basis of an application by the Fair Work Commission. In response to concerns that such a move may not be possible under existing legislation, and may thus be opposed by the CFMEU, Burke declared Labor would simply change the law. The same day, the Australian Council of Trade Unions voted to suspend the CFMEU's affiliation and called for the construction division to accept the appointment of an administrator. Within five days of the first allegations being published, the deal was, to all intents and purposes, done. The Labor government, with the full support of the ACTU and most unions in the country, had decided that the construction division of the CFMEU would be smashed up by any means necessary. The speed with which this all unfolded underscores that it was not a response to the allegations, but a premeditated and coordinated attack. 
Labor, the ACTU and industry lobby groups then worked together to draft the anti-worker legislation that would be introduced as the first order of business when Parliament resumed on August 12th. This was rammed through with the support of virtually the entire political establishment. The Liberal National Opposition demanded several amendments to make the legislation harsher, to which Labor quickly agreed, underscoring their sense of urgency. On August 23, less than 24 hours after the legislation to enable it was proclaimed, the Federal Labor Government placed the Construction Division of the CFMEU under administration and removed almost 300 union officials, organisers and delegates from their posts. Many workers expressed shock that such an attack had been carried out by a Labor government and that the ACTU had been so openly complicit. But as the Socialist Equality Party alone has consistently highlighted and explained, these are the forces that have been at the forefront of every major attack on the working class over the past 40 years. In the 1980s, the ACTU partnered with big business and the Hawke Labor government in a series of tripartite accords. Drafted by the union officialdom, they provided for the deregulation of the economy, the destruction of whole sections of industry and the decimation of hundreds of thousands of jobs. A key component of this was the deregistration of the Builders Laborers Federation, the BLF, about which others will speak more later. In the 1990s, the Keating Labor government worked with the ACTU to introduce enterprise bargaining, dividing workers workplace by workplace. That framework has been relied upon ever since by the union bureaucracy to impose sellout agreements and prevent any industry-wide struggle by workers. In 2009, the union-backed Rudd Labor government introduced the Fair Work Act and the pro-business tribunal, now known as the Fair Work Commission. The draconian legislation extended the attacks on workers' rights carried out under Hawke and Keating, outlawing virtually all industrial action. Even before the attack on the CFMEU, the current Labor government had taken this further. Again, acting with the full support of the unions, Labor introduced new industrial relations laws aimed at further empowering the industrial courts to suppress the class struggle. This includes intractable bargaining laws under which the Fair Work Commission can declare a dispute intractable, shut down any industrial action and impose the demands of management through arbitration. Now, these developments are part of an international process. The unions have always defended capitalism and the interests of a privileged bureaucracy within it. But in an earlier period, the bureaucracy could fulfil this function by pressuring nationally based corporations and governments to provide limited concessions to workers. The globalisation of production obliterated the basis of that program. The unions became transformed into fully corporatised entities whose role is to ensure that their own national industry remains competitive in the international market through a continuous reduction in labour costs. The CFMEU and its ousted leadership are no exception. For decades, they have been aligned with pro-business labour governments and have suppressed any struggle by construction workers. Their sole preoccupation throughout this administration has been to maintain the positions and the privileges of the CFMEU officialdom. This was clearly expressed in the fact that in the six weeks between the first call for the construction union to be smashed, not a single strike was organised to oppose it. This was because the CFMEU bureaucrats were busy engaging in various backroom manoeuvres with the government, the ACTU and the industrial courts aimed at imposing administration on terms that didn't hurt their own interests. It is becoming increasingly clear that this was underway even before the question of administration was publicly raised. On Thursday, CFMEU National Secretary Zach Smith 
claimed that he had met with Burke on July 13 and received a personal undertaking that the union would be allowed to deal with the situation internally by placing the Victorian branch under administration, as Smith would then announce on July 15. Now, this would appear to corroborate claims made by Setka in August that his resignation was part of a deal cooked up between the CFMEU leadership, the Labor government and the ACTU. Perhaps the clearest evidence that some sort of a backroom deal was struck is the fact that Smith remains National Secretary, one of the few high-ranking construction union officials kept on by the administrator as a trusted facilitator of Labor's attack. Smith is also a member of the Labor Party's national executive. Only after the legislation was passed and many of the CFMEU bureaucrats found themselves out of a job were the first strike rallies organised. These were not directed at defending the wages, conditions and rights of workers, but restoring the privileges of the ousted leaders. The starkest expression of this was a resolution moved at the Melbourne rally that sacked CFMEU leaders should be allowed to retain their positions in the leadership of the industry superannuation funds. That is, the CFMEU has no opposition to this attack on the rights of construction workers. The ousted bureaucrats aspire to be what Zach Smith is, a flunky of the administration and the government who will continue to receive his enormous salary by enforcing the dictates of the construction companies. The CFMEU leadership's role is increasingly exposed. For this, in this case, they need political cover and assistance. That is being provided by the pseudo-left organisations, including Socialist Alliance, which have helped to establish the falsely named rank-and-file hands off the CFMEU group. This group is not a rank-and-file organisation, but one which is collaborating with the CFMEU bureaucracy and which has its official approval and authorisation. Socialist Alliance and the other pseudo-left organisations present the administration of the CFMEU as a single issue, unconnected from Labor's broader agenda of wage cuts, austerity and war. They insist that the administration can be overturned or at least ameliorated under the leadership of the CFMEU bureaucracy. What this means in practice is to subordinate workers to a lobbying campaign directed to the union apparatus and the very Labor government carrying out the attack. Like the sacked CFMEU leadership itself, this fake rank and file group does not even oppose administration. The group has completely endorsed Smith's claim that union members can carry on with business as usual as if nothing had happened. This is not a mistake. Socialist Alliance and the pseudo left do not resent represent socialism or the working class in any way. They speak for a layer of the upper middle class, which pursues its own privileges within capitalism and is tied by a thousand threads to the political establishment, particularly labor and the union bureaucracy. Socialist Alliance's use of the term rank and file is thus a deliberate fraud. This is not a rank and file group. It is a PR exercise on behalf of the union bureaucracy to suppress rank and file opposition. While this group operates with the approval of the CFMEU officials, the response of the union bureaucracy to the SEP has been very different. SEP campaigners have been threatened and accosted by supporters of the CFMEU leadership when we have campaigned at building sites in Melbourne. That is because we are fighting for a real rank and file movement. Such a movement means a complete rebellion against both the ousted CFMEU bureaucracy and the CFMEU leaders who remain in the union collaborating with the administrator. It means establishing genuine rank and file committees independent of and opposed to the bureaucracy. Such committees must be controlled by workers themselves, not the privileged bureaucrats and their hangers-on. 
the SEP is committed to providing every political assistance to workers to form rank and file committees. Through these committees, building workers can prepare a bold campaign of strikes and other industrial action demanding the removal of the administrator and the repeal of the latest draconian legislation. Any attempt by employers to tear up, modify or circumvent existing agreements should be answered with indefinite stoppages. But this fight is much bigger than the building industry. Rank and file committees of construction workers must make a powerful appeal to workers everywhere. The fight against Labor's attack on the CFMEU is a fight for the wages, conditions and democratic rights of the entire working class. If this attack is not defeated, it will be extended to other sections of workers amid demands for sweeping austerity from the ruling elite. There is growing opposition among cons construction workers and workers more broadly. That is an international development. The same crisis of capitalism, which is propelling the ruling elites to war and dictatorship, is providing an impulse for mass struggles by the working class. These struggles pose major political issues, which are sharply concentrated in the fight against administration. This is a fight against the Labor government, all of the parliamentary parties and the capitalist state itself, including the industrial relations framework and the courts. It objectively poses the need for a break with the Labor Party and the entire union bureaucracy. Above all, what workers face is the need for a new revolutionary socialist perspective. Capitalism, in its death agony, offers a future of mass unemployment and poverty, authoritarianism and world war. The alternative is the perspective of our movement, socialist revolution. The critical issue is to build an independent movement of the working class that has as its aim the taking of political power. Society must be reorganised globally to meet the social needs of working people not the profit dictates of the banks and the corporations, including the construction companies and the property developers. This program is viable because it is necessary. I would urge everyone here and everyone listening online to take up this fight for socialism.